Life is a painting. If it's too out of focus, then there's not really any sense to make of it. If it's too close, then all the mistakes come to the surface and the real point is lost. It's the middle ground, taking in what matters where things come together and can be appreciated at their deepest level. There's a character in Mujin Razen by the name of Tomoe Enjo. A good bit of the plot focuses on him holed up in a room, struggling to come to grips with where his life is going. During this ever so contemplative part of the story, he's recently killed his own mother. In self-defense, but that still doesn't change the facts, nor that his life is essentially over when he gets caught. It's his violent retaliation that serves as this movie's hook. The scene evokes shock. Injo's movements are frantically kinetic and what he has blaring in his head is clear. Kill her before she kills me. As an opener, it's slightly confusing nature and morbid action set the tone going forward. This tale is called the Paradox Spiral and it's going to indulge in its namesake. The direction, done by Takeyuki Hirao, doesn't shy away from making things erratic and nonsensical in order. Yet, by some stroke of genius, the scenes flow together in a way that makes everything click. Take the brief moments before matricide. We see Enjo waking up, followed by fragments of what's going on outside his room, before returning back to it with a quick panning shot of some of his belongings of which contains study supplies, a medal, and a picture of him running track. This is a school-age boy with a promising athletic future ahead of him. What prevents that from being the path our boy takes is the very thing that jarringly cuts between the view of his belongings. Tomoe and Joe's parents. This is less than 10 seconds, and it gets across the vast majority of Enjo's backstory and motivation not only for why he can defend himself so viscerally against his Okasan, but for what he does from there on out. He's a relatively normal, if mentally fragile, lad who was pushed to the brink and is running from the consequences. The shot composition in this movie is chock full of stuff like this. Now, that's not to say it doesn't know when to slow things down, it does. It's just that in the intense moments, it's purposefully overbearing and those quick snippets brimming with information, it's not expecting you to take everything in. It's just planting little seeds. Take that photo Enjo has of him running track. Later into the film, when he's watching ads on a billboard, he sees himself in the runner on screen. Aside from the overt symbolism of Enjo is literally running from things, it's something that doesn't seem odd or out of place because of his track picture in the intro. That idea of, oh, Enjo is a good track runner, fully blooms at this moment, even if only subconsciously in the viewer's mind. This movie is like a puzzle. Most of the pieces are dumped out in quick bursts, but then the plot takes its time coming through every detail one by one so that it all comes together. The viewer is involved in this as well because it's up to them to put a few things together all on their own. Take our lad Enjo. Regarding his depressive and oppressive home life, no one states the obvious to reiterate how bad it was, nor does Enjo go into his feelings about it all. The audience is expected to get why he reacts to stuff the way he does based on his experiences and, well, how he acts. Despite this being the longest Kara no Kyokai movie, it doesn't waste its time with the needless chatter. This film demands attention, and it respects its audience's ability to parse simple things like Enjo's feelings about his life. During the scene where Enjo's attention is being zapped up by advertising, Enjo looks at the billboard, sees Runner, and gets entranced with the nostalgia. It's really simple stuff, but damn if a lot of anime don't fuck it up. Scenes like this are a dime a fucking dozen in the realm of Japanimation. Most, however, make the brazen, horrible mistake of making the protagonist monologue to themselves about the blatantly apparent. The direction and script in a visual medium isn't just meant to be how the story is conveyed. It itself 
is a storytelling method. That's something criminally underappreciated in the medium, and KNK5 knocks it out of the park. On that note, Shiki's introduction. She shows up obscured by steam, billowing through a grimy back alley, and stomps some curbs. Just her gentle caress is enough to make someone vomit. Would she do that to me? Shiki is a neurotic, adorable, sadism-loving angel, and this movie is her at peak form. Seeing this as capable as she is cute goddess before him makes Enjo fall to his knees. To him, who lacks stability, it's only completely, completely and utterly, utterly natural, natural that he asks Shiki to take him in. She has herself altogether. Doesn't matter that she's terrifying or outright says, I'm a murderer in a way only a true psychopath could do, charismatically as to make it endearing. This story was originally where Kara no Kyokai ended. Relevant point, because through that framework, it makes Shiki's flashy kimono-fixing antics, God, I love this shot, and complete feeling depiction start to make more sense. The first four stories are the bulk of her development. They center around a little way she grows and is influenced by the world, all of which mostly relate to her inner self. After all that introspection, she self-actualized. What do now? That's what her arc is all about here. Which is plenty fine, but it doesn't require her to be in the driver's seat anymore. I mean, literally, she's not in the driver's seat anymore, she's on the sidecar, get it? Ha. Huh. Hence why, from this movie onward, she either takes a back seat or is paired with someone else. In place of the introspective nightmares of Shiki Ryogi, this time around there's about a 30 minute stretch that's just her and Enjo living their lives together. The music played during this part starts off on easy, asking a silent question about the duo of murderer housemates. Question being, is this situation okay or going to work out in the slightest? Shiki's never been one for hospitality, and Enjo is spiraling in panic more every day. But then it gets calm as those worries fade into a peaceful doldrum. The tune isn't outright jovial or anything, it's actually quite melancholic, but it's a relaxing kind of malaise. It signals that though there might be turbulent times ahead, for now the characters get to rest and go about their meaningless days. There's a snag to the ephemeral comfort Enjo and Shiki share that can taint it a bit in retrospect though, at least depending on your outlook. Our boy Enjo technically isn't real. He's a replica made to fulfill a specific purpose, which he does to a T. Everything down to him having feelings for Shiki to killing his mother was all preordained to happen. It is the objective truth that his actions were never his own. Can you really call that human? Or maybe it's not as simple as that. Was every action he took predetermined? From eating ice cream to opening a door? If he did have some control, then I'd say you can't write him off entirely. We, by which I mean us as a species, are told what to do at jobs by our parents or our influences. It may not be set in stone and you may feel like you can deviate, but do you ever? If it's okay to write Enjo off because his actions and feelings are all given to him, then where's the line? If being 100% organic is the ticket, then that'd rule out someone who has artificial limbs. You know, like Shiki, who at this point in the story is mostly doll parts. Also, as someone with a pacemaker, I take a little bit of ire with saying that someone is a lesser because they have mechanical stuff as a part of their body. There's a moment midway through the film of Enjo looking at a puppet that looks just like Ryogi. He stares at it with this profound gaze too. The film wants you to know that he's pondering it deeply, and that by proxy, you should probably think about it as well. This isn't just a neat callback to the first movie, it's showing that Enjo and Shiki are the same. 
They both have artificial parts, yet both retain ample humanity despite it. All it takes is a look at Shiki in the first movie, eating ice cream on her bed while waiting for a new arm for that to come to light. She takes parts that were given to her and makes them her own. Shiki is more than a little straightforward with her thinking, mind you, but why couldn't Enjo do the same even if it's with his very existence? Writing this line and waxing poetic about what it means to be truly human is fun, or, you know, maybe it's just pretentious, let me know in the comments. But in reality, it all harkens back to what I said at the start. It doesn't matter if Enjo is real or fake, if his actions were his own or not. As he so eloquently puts at his end, I was here. There's a reason that one little line is the most quoted in all of Kara no Kyokai. It's one of those things that I think, for a large number of people, speaks to them on this deep, intrinsic level. It takes this broad, contemplative idea about what it means to exist, and wraps it all succinctly with one utterance. It's also the culmination of Enjo's entire arc. Everyday life is a cyclical rut. To our lad, the same things happen again and again, and he finds himself stuck in the copious days. I don't think it's an out there statement to say that doing the same things every day can be mind numbing, but there is an underappreciated beauty to it. At no point are Enjo or Shiki shown to be unhappy with how things are going. For Shiki's part, she's got that pragmatic way of thinking. To her, it's just fun to have someone around. You know, she gets to prod him, ask him if he's got a girlfriend. It's very wholesome. But for Enjo, though he looks a tad out of it sometimes, his comfort in the situation all comes back to the one thing he lacked. Shiki and his new environment provide structure. For every scene of him sulking or staring blankly into the clothes dryer, there's one of him doing things for Shiki or enjoying genuine conversation. It should be noted that he does those things, not out of any kind of debt that's owed by him, but because he cares about Shiki. He has this person in his life, and though she's more than able to take care of herself, he wants to show that he can help her in a small way too, his own way. It's wholesome moments like that between the times Enjo spends meandering the streets, isolated from the world despite the crowd surrounding him. It can be easy to get lost in the bitterness of feeling like you're not doing anything worthwhile, especially as the days keep passing and passing with a little change. I think repetition and the mindset that comes with it is damaging to the brain. Not like actually, but even if you do something that makes a positive impact on tons and tons of people, at some point along the lines of performing the same actions, it's going to be harder to see any effect you're actually having. Repetition, in most cases, leads to losing perspective. Maybe I'm off the mark, but that's the trend I've noticed with people and myself. Sometimes I get in the headspace that my life is worthless, that everything I do is ultimately a waste because it will never amount to anything. My brain's been on that kind of gridlock for more than I care to recall lately. If you're wondering why this video is, you know, it coming out hopefully late February, maybe the last day of February sometime, maybe even in March, that's why I've spent the better part of a month just utterly mentally incapacitated. Oddly enough though, I find that following that nauseating routine when life is nothing but black pills often is what lets me return to some semblance of normalcy. Things get sorted, perspective on my actions return, and the gears of life start turning. It's a hell of a trial, but it's never a losing battle. What I'm writing, and in the future will be saying right now, was all started because I leaped up in a fever pitch bid to get out of bed and actually do something before I go insane. It's been about half an hour since, and yeah, I feel way better because I did what I normally do every day. Yet, what put me in bed in the first place was listlessness about doing just that. Outside of this antidote though, it's something you can see all around. It is a trend permeating our society. Artists getting burnt out and wanting to give up. Students flunking because they can't see any reason to work for it tomorrow that may or may not be there. Or just a bad day when nothing feels right. Anyone can lose motivation and perspective on their life. 
However, anyone can also gain it back by doing the same actions they have been doing, just with a new mindset. Mindfulness, just practicing mindfulness, it's an incredible thing. But more importantly, it's a paradox, plain and simple. Everyday life is a paradox. And this all ties into what I think Nasu's mindset was with Mujun Razen. Disillusion with his day-to-day -day life and everything he wrote. This little idea really gets going when looking at Enjo, a character who is revealed to be someone who never had an original thought or idea. A total, unabashed fake. If that isn't my boy Kinoko projecting, I don't know what is. This is a man who wears his influences on his sleeve to a point that fringes on plagiarism. Case in point, Kizuato, a visual novel by Leaf which hinges around the plot of an estranged relative going back home after the death of his father, whereupon he starts having homicidal impulses, the murders he envisions in his dreams being reality the next day. Compare that to Tsukihime, a work released by Type Moon only a few years after, wherein the plot revolves around an estranged relative going back home after the death of his father, whereupon he starts having homicidal impulses, the murders he envisions in his dreams being reality the next day. It's not even subtle. Ergo, it's understandable that Nasu writes stories where the main character is a quote-unquote fake. He probably felt like that himself. Especially during the era Kara no Kyokai was written, a time when he was a new author just trying his best to make a good story. How do you do that? How does one spin a good yarn? Well, subconsciously or not, you take from the stories that you like and rearrange the pieces, adding in your own elements and changing what you didn't like about the original. The plot of Kizuato shares many similarities with Tsukihime, but Tsukihime does have elements that makes it unique. True ancestors, magic, dead apostles, and the mystic eyes of death perception. All that stuff. Not to mention, though I haven't read it myself, I have heard from sources that I trust that Tsukihime is generally considered to be way better. Nasu took things from others and made them his own, in a way not dissimilar to the character he writes in this story. Tomoe Enjo doesn't have anything unique to his name at the start of this tale. Not even his abusive past is technically his own. What does Enjo do when he realizes he's a fake? He ignores the truth and preps himself to go on a suicidal bum rush in an attempt to save Shiki. That's not a selfless act, though. He takes absolutely no time to consider how Shiki or others would feel about him throwing his life away. In other words, Enjo has no perspective. Compare that to a burnt-out writer prepping to scrap a story because they feel it can't live up to expectations. That what they're writing is just a rip-off anyways. Not even taking the time to revise and see what's not working, and not thinking about anyone else their decision might affect. In that situation, the writer has to take a step back, breathe, and remember that there are people who care about what they write, and that it'll be good as long as they put their heart into it. From that point, they just have to get back to it. I'm not saying Nasu even did anything remotely similar to the events I'm describing, it's just the metatextual reading of the work that I have. I'm not gonna pretend like it's anything more. On that meta note though, the level of separation between replica Enjo and actual Enjo is a good indicator of how Nasu, maybe, writes and views his lovely characters. He knows what an abusive home life can do to someone. I mean, he majored in human science and that clearly has an influence on all of his work. But even so, he can't draw from his own experience. He can only imitate it in what he writes. Replin Joe is doing the very same. Though it's assumed that he's close to the original, he ultimately is just a facsimile of what the real Enjo would have been like. Similarly, Nasu is only making estimations with his characters and how their environment would shape them. There's a good way and a bad way to go about writing characters, and I think Nasu's are something that shines so wonderfully because he knows how to make them feel grounded. An author may not have lived experiences they can draw from all the time, but what's important is that they write the characters as if they did. 
They put on the character's shoes and anchor them, not to reality, but to themselves, asking things like, if I were this person in this situation, what would I do? See, in most any good story, the characters within are just different reflections of the author. Drawing from oneself is usually a pretty good way to ensure that a character is fleshed out meaningfully. After all, if an author draws from something they blatantly have no experience with, it always shows. Take, for instance, a story where there is a super smart, beautiful, inspiring, gorgeous, just all-around salacious, glasses-wearing girl. Let's call her Megane Nesan. If the author pinning her into existence is not knowledgeable on the same level Megane Nesan is supposed to be, it's gonna show. Megane Nesan will act in stupid ways unbefitting of her intellect because the author is drawing from a well that's dry. Toko in the first movie suffers a bit from that. When she spouts her dark wisdom about the states of flying, floating, and falling, it comes off as way more pretentious than I think was intended. As I said back in the first part, I like the message and do understand it. But Toko there is not the same Toko even one story later. Nasu was writing a character out of his realm of understanding during that time, and the effect is that Toko reads as pompous, going on these long, wordy diatribes that fail to reach anywhere near the realm of succinctness and intellect she'd display later on. After Nasu hones his writing abilities and becomes a more worldly person with time, suddenly Toko evolves into a character that's more grounded. No longer is she attempting to sound smart, she just is. The way she speaks after that first movie always immediately clicks and actually feels like sage-esque advice. When she lectures Asuka on magic in Mujun Larazen, it's a good, straightforward explanation. Toko in movie one would fail at that. Here's a more personable example of this talk of writing. When I'm penning female characters in my own work, you can probably tell it by my voice, but I don't have the lived experience of being female but I can listen to other people who have to live that or have written about it and apply it to myself. Taking their ideas, the character I envision, and then passing both through the filter of me, I can write my own Megane Nesan into believability status. This thought process of taking things in and converting them to your own ideas applies to way more than just characters, by the way. It works with every aspect of making something, be it world building, drawing, composing music, literally anything creative. Hell, this extends to more than just being inspired by other people. As a creator, you can also take inspiration from your past self, seeing how the ideas you had work in a new light and whatnot. And I'm not talking about remakes either. Nasu does what I'm referring to blatantly with Tsukihime. The mystic eyes, Shiki, and Aozaki sister split personality, just most things. That isn't bad though. Despite those overt similarities, no one would call Kara no Kyokai and Tsukihime derivative of one another outside of a bad joke. The works are unique to one another because they take those similar concepts and run in all kinds of different directions. Isn't making stuff cool? I love making stuff. I hope you like the stuff I make, dear viewer. On that note, if you've watched this far and have enjoyed it, please do like, comment, and share this thing around to anyone and everyone. I'm really close to 2K subs, and I think that's fucking amazing. Also, I may not have any sponsors or monetization, but I do have a Patreon. Please, consider supporting me financially if you can. There's some sick rewards in it for you if you do. Thank you for listening to my shilling. I want to be remembered. I think everyone wants that, but I'm talking like a hundred years from now. Of course, in the digital age, being remembered is as simple as someone stumbling across an old webpage you posted on, but in the past, it was pretty much impossible. We have so few individual records of people that lived even 500 years ago, when electricity wasn't a thing and wars were still fought on horseback. Those people all lived lives, had their own thoughts and aspirations, yet we'll never know them. We'll only sum them up along with their way of life. 
When you think of a peasant in medieval terms, you probably think of an idea, not a person. If it is a person, it's a movie or perversion of the way those people actually would have lived. Again, no significant records. All we have is crumbling archaeology and guesswork. It's kind of a bummer, isn't it? Not to mention the nagging feeling that maybe we'll all be like that too one day. Not remembered as an individual, but as a collective. It's from that train of thought that I began to appreciate the walking used pad of Kar no Kyokai, Area Soren. Someone who, as you might recall if you've seen prior parts, I didn't regard all that highly. In the time since those videos, though, I've had a little change of heart. Just a little. But still. I think his retroactive inclusion into the story, shoving him into places where he really wasn't needed, well, wasn't needed. Characters like Fujino have plenty of motivation on their own, and his forced involvement in their stories will always feel like a, ah, but it was really me all along, moment. A cheap gotcha to make it seem like this was planned from the start when there is no way in hell it was. If Nasu says otherwise or has stated otherwise, you could not convince me that the man isn't lying through his goddamn teeth. To jump ahead a bit, I think this whole thing is a problem Nasu saw as well, because in Kara no Kyokai 7, Arya is utilized in the way I think he should have always been. After characters like Fujino's respective point of no return, he should have shown up with the promise of making them worse. For example, say Fujino kills all of her rapist, and then Arya shows up when her tensions are at her highest, and pushes her to kill innocents because, as it turns out, Pulpifying her assaulters leaves her feeling hollow. It still takes away some urgency for Miss Asagami, mind you, but I think that it'd be better than robbing her of the choice to kill in the first place. Maybe that'd work, or maybe it wouldn't. This is all just hypothetical. The point is that Arya up until now has only made me groan and loathe him in a way the story definitely didn't intend, and Kara no Kyokai 7 is proof that it could have been done so much better. Now, all that said, I think Arya is legitimately good in this movie. I don't find him particularly deep or enthralling, but his plight of wanting people to be remembered is admirable. He wants to exonerate them so that their deaths won't just be another casualty or faceless statistic. That's a good reason to seek out the root. It's also easy to see how such a broad, impossible-seeming goal would drive him to the point he's at in this movie. Utterly lost in the sauce, not even recalling what it is he wanted to do in the first place. To speculate on lore, I think Arya is indicative of a certain proclivity in the Nasuverse. The Root, also known as the Akashic Record in Kara no Kyokai, is a monkey's paw. That is to say, it can 100% be reached. But the reason you never hear about someone doing so successfully is because to get to that point, you essentially have to mind break yourself. Take Arya. He had admirable ambitions to reach the records, but in pursuit of doing so, his perception, both figuratively and quite literally, became warped until it was unrecognizable. We see how he originally was, a functioning normal person with compassion. His endpoint was doomed to be just inches away from his goal because that compassionate impetus gave way to selfish desire. Arya has long since forgotten his initial path, instead caring way more for conducting science experiments for his own kicks and blindly forcing his way to the root. Just as something to do. That's the path I think most magists go down if they do go searching for the records, because unless there's someone like Zeltric, a character who's more of an enigmatic legend than an actual person, they're just not going to reasonably do it. Pursuing the root can take centuries. For one person to feasibly do it means that they have to unnaturally extend their lifespan, becoming less human and more cut off from society with each passing cycle. Arya threw away his everyday life and got lost in his own mind. He states that he only seeks the truth within himself, and that, frankly, is why he and every other mage who followed a similar path failed. Every human is said to be connected to the records. By becoming the opposite of such, these mages just artificially estrange themselves from the very thing they seek. They essentially just become broken cogs, 
sticking to what's familiar, and spinning indefinitely into oblivion. As for how each Magus determines their method of going about the never-ending quest, it all comes down to their origin. The root exists for the world itself, but on a smaller scale, origins exist for individuals. They are essentially the springboard from which a human bases their actions. For example, Adia's origins is quiescence. Quiescence means inactivity or dormancy. Considering his methods in this movie are essentially just waiting around for stuff to happen in a looping death condo, I'd say that makes sense. One can defy their origin, but to give in to it makes things flow more naturally. Keeping that in mind makes Adia's actions and overall plan make way more sense. It's why he does things like letting Cornelius take Toko's head. Man has minimal input and is just letting things happen, because that's what speaks to his soul. Adia's actual plan, in the simplest terms I can manage, involves replicas of people who were once alive and are now living their last day on Ludovic. The dead bodies of the actual individuals are on one side of the building. That's why the elevator does the thing where it turns as it goes up, and why the room plates were all switched. The replicas have the exact same memories as their original. Having them go to different rooms would create a discrepancy in their recollection, but having them go to their normal rooms would lead to them seeing their corpses. Which would kind of throw the whole thing off. A good bit of the plot is predicated on discussing all this, yet somehow it's only through analyzing it that it finally makes sense to me. The purpose of Arya's little science experiment is to see if things are truly predetermined or if free will is actually a factor that changes things. That's one reason he does all this. The other, of course, is to reach those savory Akashic records once he adds Shiki to the mix. Yin-yangs are everywhere throughout this movie, down to even the silverware. It's an inescapable part of this movie. Related, Ryogi is the term used for the force that keeps a yin-yang perpetually moving. Here's a little theory for ya. If the building and residents within it are meant to symbolize a yin-yang, with people alive in the morning and dead at night, wouldn't putting in Ryogi Shiki complete that little puzzle? It's her that'd get this little spiral of death swirling so that Adia can dive into the center of it and grasp the root. Hell, when Shiki uses her mystic eyes on him, she doesn't see lines, but she does see a swirl. Hinting towards Adia's goal and how close he is to it, Shiki, as established in the fourth movie, is connected to the root. Once she's bound in Adia's combo of perpetual spiraling death, I'd imagine all Arya would have to do is use her as a springboard to reach it. It's a shame the movie doesn't focus more on this aspect. It's not really important. For the purposes of the story, all we really need to know is that Adia wants the root but I can't help but feel the whole concept comes across as a little muddled. What I gave is my best approximation of what Adia is doing. Even looking at the Type Moon wiki and other such analysis of this plot online, there's really nothing concrete. Clear as day, though, is that the tension ramping in this movie is amazing. The film teases just about all the fucky action set pieces right at the start, and once Shiki and Enjo get to Arya's complexing complex, those initial glimpses inch ever closer. That makes the following two scenes leading up to the violence all the more pensive to the audience. Shiki and Enjo go to Tomoe's old apartment, where he believes his parents should be lying dead. But they aren't. Instead, Adia's replicas are performing their actions dutifully. Interesting thing to note about all this is the jarring lack of blood. This was a thing during the hook, too. When Enjo stabs his mother, there's practically none of the red stuff. Yet, he still holds her organs in his hands. That extra step that might seem a bit much establishes that the lack of blood is an intentional choice and not the movie shying on violence or some arbitrary reason. It's all just making it clear that every one of them's fake from the get-go. The movie wants you to think about this real deeply too, because Shiki, goddess that she is, verbally points out the lack of blood when she sees Enjo's mom killing everyone. So you know, note it, mark it down, Really think about it, audience. What does it mean?
Speaking of depressingly murderous antics and things leading up to them, the shot where Enjo's father abuses his wife before the wife bashes his head in lays out way differently than the first time around. Not in actions, but in framing. Whereas the initial version was played for setting the mood and engaging the viewer immediately with a what the fuck moment, this sticks to one singular wide shot. Not moving an inch until everything is played out. There's no dressing it up in pretty shot direction to make it more dramatic. This is an abusive family. And for an entire minute and 20 seconds on the dot, you have to live with them. The shot only changes once Enjo's mother switches her thoughts to her son. It's something, again, seen multiple times in this movie, but now it's blocked behind a door, obfuscated. What's happening is obvious, but right now it's not clear why. Why are these actions repeating with replicas? Add to this pot the next scene where Shiki and Enjo visit the place where he and his family lie dead, and the snuffing anxiety starts boiling over. The camera focuses in on the bodies of the mother and father real close, before moving to a frame where you can just barely make out the state they're in. They're still in the shot, but it's deliberately avoiding the nitty gritty. The camera is much more interested in showing how Enjo is taking this sight in. He starts to break down. He can accept that his parents are deceased, but confronting the truth dead on is haunting. Not to mention the lingering thought he has of what about me? He and the camera by proxy deliberately ignore confronting that. I think this was done to give the audience a little hope. Hope that our lad is the real one. After all, he's been at Shiki's for a long time, so it follows that his folks would be in this kind of state. Rather the viewer accepts that hope or not, the movie has presented all of its puzzle pieces in an orderly fashion. I want to feel I just, just might not be killed someone, someone one day is a line Shiki says after a macabre moment of her murderous intent being visualized. Amazing sequence, leaves me breathless. Shiki has an inclination towards violence, just in general. So seeing her finally act on impulse with a reckless abandon is oh so amazing. Ghouls surround Shiki, but she utterly destroys them in a beautifully animated sequence. This film uses the Shiki cam technique something I'm usually not fond of. However, I think it actually works really well here. See, it's usually used to hide the fact that the action is shitty by making it seem more frantic than it really is. Take pretty much any live action movie with it. But Mujun Razan takes it and uses it in a way that I think benefits the film exponentially. In prior entries, Shiki was usually on top and dominating. Take the rooftop fight in Fukan Fukei. There, the camera movements are swift and agile in step with Shiki. It creates this nice and fluid feeling encounter that leaves most in awe when they see it, myself included. Here though, while her movements may be fierce, she's in unfamiliar territory. Out of tempo with her surroundings, though she still conducts herself admirably. The camera during the combat is linked to Shiki's control over a fight. In the curb stop near the stop, she's entirely in her element, so there was barely any jitter. When she's swarmed by ghouls, there's a little shake. Near the end of the movie against Adia, it goes absolutely mental because the fight could go either way so hard that all the camera can do is spasm. It conveys the ferocity of each situation with the gravitas required. Not to mention all the swerving camera movements in the world can hide the fact that the choreography of these fights is certainly up to snuff. When Shiki acquires her sword, the Kanasada Kuji, she implements the exact same kendo techniques she was practicing in the second movie. She's traditionally trained with the sword and the animators take great care to show off that fact. Here are some of Shiki's actions that are influenced heavily by traditional kendo. Look, they're on screen right now. I better edit that or I'm going to Arya, by comparison, may not be trained in any real style, but you can feel the force behind his actions. When his bounded field hit Shiki's blade, she doesn't just cut through it. Arya's powerful, so Shiki has to force her way through. 
even with her self-suggestion. Which, given Arya's dialogue about Shiki using it to be good with a knife, I had thought for years only meant she was using it to trick herself into being good with a small blade. But it's actually way cooler than that. Or way more contrived, depending on your outlook. Honestly, it depends on the day for me. One look at the Type Moon Wiki revealed to me that self-suggestion means that Shiki rewires her entire body, starting with the brain, to be purely for combat. To the point that she doesn't even have to breathe. Once the fight against Arya ramps up, this is all more overt. I mean, she stabs him mid-air in one of the best set pieces in the series, if not just flat out the best one. I think it's the best one, it's fucking amazing. She stabs him so hard it creates a fucking crater. Shiki is powerful. The reason Arya says the katana is Shiki's real weapon isn't out of any training she's had or anything. It's more in line with the philosophy of a blade being an extension of oneself. Add self-suggestion, her training from a young age, and the sheer range of a sword compared to a knife, and Arya's word choice makes way more sense. Here's something cool to note while on the subject. Kane Sadakuji, which again is Shiki's katana, has the ability to instantly dispel a bounded field once it's unsheathed. That's why Shiki can pop out of the elevator to fight Arya. She doesn't just do it because she's cool. I didn't put that together until now, so hopefully I'm not the only one. All in all, the action in this movie is just really well done. Probably the best in the series, though it has been a while since I've watched Seven. But then again, Kara no Kyokai 7 doesn't have any swords, so hefty blowback. Blades, flashy camera movements, tasteful depictions of Shiki's feet. Mujun Razen is stacked with tons of uniquely wondrous elements. There's still one more to talk about, though. The eye catchers. They're used to separate the movie into three distinct parts. The first act lasts until Shiki gets aboard, the second until Miki is about to meet Enjo, and the last combines the cast of both parts for the final stretch. This movie's structure is like, and again with them being everywhere, a yin yang. The black and white eye catcher flipping as the film swaps perspectives from Shiki plus Enjo to Mikia plus Toko is plenty indicative of that. Likewise, yin yangs have a little black in the white and white in the black, something the filmmakers took into account. Mikia and Toko were technically in the first part, but it's a stretch to say that they were involved in that section's plot. Likewise, Shiki and Enjo technically make appearances in this part, but Shiki's never even on screen screen and Enjo doesn't talk, so did they really? Also, whereas part A is mostly spent with these contemplative shots or in combat, Mikia and Toko's slice of the plot consists of essentially just dialogue. The conversations are split across three different scenes that are all spliced into one another to create simplicity. Now, forcing different conversations together might sound like the antithesis of simplifying something, but the moment you realize that everything is essentially just one very long talk, it becomes way easier to follow. If this were in a novel, guess what K&K originally was? Crazy, I know. These scenes would be explicitly separate and details would simply be repeated to the reader. Which is something that works for that medium because the author has way less elements to convey what they want to get across. It's only text, so you have to raise the concepts to the reader a few times because, and especially if you're being a subtle slash stubborn writer like our boy Nasu, the average reader may not pick up on things immediately. Especially if it's world building. Which in my experience, seeing people trying and failing to talk about Nasuverse stuff has the tendency to fly over people's heads. This movie very well could have gone the approach of having these scenes separate. Hell, most adaptations of a novel, visual or otherwise, will go that approach to appease the fans who will riot if everything's not one to one. I think that approach is flawed like 90% of the time though. If Mujun Razen had gone the talky way, then a few problems are immediately apparent. First and foremost, this movie is close to two hours. I don't think this is an inherent bad, mind you. I think anime should be as long as the story requires, no more, no less. But you have to take the culture of the time into account. This movie came out in 2008. Hey, wanna feel old? That was 14 years ago. I was seven. 
A two hour movie was considered pushing it for any theater back then. But that's just a small world relevant issue. Big movies existed back then and will continue to persist. The more pressing issue would be the huge pace breaker now smack dab in the middle of the film. You have this big moment 40 minutes into the film that gets the blood pumping and then immediately have a similar time frame spent on scenes composed only of dialogue. No snappy direction, just talking. Now, you can have interesting conversations in anime. However, KNK ain't monogatari, and I doubt that you can make the repetitive topics in these scenes work in an interesting manner. You can do something utterly pace-breaky like that in a novel because it's more of a time commitment. It's something your reader will consume over the course of a few days, and in that format, Shiki being bored serves as a nice mid-story cliffhanger while the plot shifts focus to provide clarity on things. The pacing in a film compared to a written work is typically wildly different because that's how the mediums function. I'm gonna say something that might get ire from the visual novel fans in my audience, but no adaptation should strive to be one-to-one. -one. None of them. You have to work to the qualities inherent to each medium. For instance, the inner monologue of the protagonist is something that doesn't exist in this film while it did in the novels. Monologues exist to flesh out characters in novels, but film has other ways of going about that. It doesn't have to tell you that Enjo is in a severe state of coping, it can just show that. More than anything though, in a film setting where we can see all the stuff that the characters are talking about firsthand, all this exposition back to back would just be incredibly redundant. I said before that all of the scenes in part B of the movie are secretly just the same conversation. Here's why. Asuka is a student of Toko. Toko starts lecturing Asuka on the basics of magecraft after she uses it callously. Cut mid-conversation to a scene where Toko is talking about the root, a basic magecraft idea, to knock off Kaoru Nagisa. Cut then back to the office where the conversation concludes and Asuka gets transphobic at Shiki. When Shiki blows her off and leaves, it prompts Asuka to then ask if Miki is bisexual, to which he answers, yeah, probably. Asuka, the girl who wants to bang her own brother six ways to Sunday, calls this twisted. You may feel like I'm talking about useless details here, and you're kind of right, but I just found out the other day that there exists a subsect of Asuka incest deniers in the Type Moon fanbase. I don't know how, I don't know why. I swear people will reach over the dumbest stuff. One, this is Kanoko Nasu, a man who wrote Akia, Ilya, and yeah, Asuka into existence all of which fall under the Omoto wants sex oni trope. One of them even succeeds. Good for her, good for her. Why would Asuka be the one time he decides, no, 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 this is strictly platonic, nothing more. It just doesn't follow. But way more importantly, too, it's funny. More on all that once we get to Kar no Kyokai 6, though. It's probably more, you know, relevant there, but hey. Back to my point, Shiki is brought up. Cut then to Mr. Ode to Joy talking about her and how she's missing, which then cuts to a scene where Mikia and Toko are driving and looking into what happened to her. See how all this stuff flows together? It's very natural, like, like all of this is the, ah, uh, what's the word? The same conversation, even. The cuts between the scenes are usually slick as hell, too. Every time I watch this part of the movie and someone turns a door handle, my brain starts chanting, yes, yes sir. sir. It's so clean. It also lets the viewer know where this plot is headed. Mikia goes to Shiki's apartment twice in this movie. The first time always has Mr. Akitaka there. He gives Shiki's sword to Mikia and then never returns to the series again. The second time, and the end point of this little section of the story, has Mikia at the doorway alone, turning a locked doorknob. It's cut to constantly throughout this part to let you know that the plot hasn't lost the plot. For the impatient in the audience who don't care about all this heady world building, this serves as a carrot on a stick to keep them going in these diatribe times. 
For everyone else, the cut to the door keeps ramping up the anticipation for the plot to converge. After every revelation, like when it's said that Shiki is missing, it cuts back to the door. For every instance of Alba being an utter spurg lord, it cuts back to the door. Oh, Cornelius Alba, the one thing I've purposefully ignored this entire script. So, you know Yamcha from Dragon Ball? Specifically Dragon Ball, not Z. For those of you out of the loop, Yamcha was introduced as a character of comparable strength to the protagonist, Goku. This is notable because when the next arc rolls around, it's Yamcha who gets his shit kicked in by the next big bad. It's a kind of power measuring thing to get the audience thinking. Oh no, if Goku is also about as strong as Yamcha, w will he still win against this guy? It builds stakes and all that. I bring this all up to say that Elba isn't really a character, but more of a Yamcha-esque heel. Which, a heel is wrestling terminology for someone the audience wants to see taken down. Not necessarily the main antagonist, just an asshole. This is the function Elba serves. He's introduced in part A with the veneer of confidence tailing Shiki without her noticing. Enjo, the good boy that he is, spots him. To which Alba looks back and goes, in the rapiest way possible. That on its own would be enough to spark some intrigue, but when the shot flips back to Enjo, there's a giant pair of eyes that blend into the background watching him. He and Shiki are being monitored by this man and his view is all encompassing. It's the best introduction a character like Alba could ask for. It's also the most intimidating he ever is. Alba's like that kid in seventh grade who'd put a verbal cheese grater against my eardrum by saying in an annoying voice, China, over and over again. This was something he did for months despite me telling him to stop multiple times. The teacher also wouldn't acquiesce to me wanting to sit somewhere else either, so I just quietly seethed. I wish I would've punched that kid. If I could go back in time, I would, as a grown adult, break his knees. Thinking about the lost years off my lifespan from dealing with that shit makes me want to hurl. Alba is that kid. He's annoying, a threat to the joy of everyone around him, and if you heard years later that he got shoved into a locker, you'd just smile silently to yourself. It's okay. This is karma. When it's ultimately Adia who does him in by virtue of stealing his kill and being smarter, it serves the purpose of setting Adia up as someone who's to be reckoned with. Man just tosses Alba, who was somewhat a threat, remember that introduction, aside like trash. As an aside, I find it funny that Cornelius Alba talks about wanting to be the best puppeteer around, yet he was so incompetent that he was the only one of the college trio not to use one. Inferiority complex at its finest. The point of Alba is to hate him though, so good element. You know, Alba included, this film has done some amazing setup for the final act. The first part asks questions, the second provides all the answers, and the third, fittingly, connects all the dots between the two. It's a beautiful little marriage. I love how when the plots converge with Mikia and Enjo's meeting, the eye catcher swirls together. Beautiful thematic cohesion, and it brings the whole yin yang structure all together. It's always a little jarring seeing the boys in the same place, especially knowing they both like Shiki, but they become bros at the end. I adore that. Their dynamic's short, but sweet. Mikia is like an older brother to Enjo. He understands what our lad is going through, but he doesn't coddle him. He knows what Enjo needs, but also is cognizant that Enjo needs to get there by himself or it won't matter. Mikia simply nudges Enjo in the right direction and lets him actualize on his own. What I consider the most underappreciated aspect of Kar no Kyokai, probably because it's not as pronounced as everything else, is the sheer growth Mikio Kokoto displays. With Shiki in the second movie, he was too assertive and nearly got himself killed in trying to help them. With Fujino, he was far too laissez-faire and she ran off to murder before the night was out. Here though, he helps Enjo through his suicidal tendencies in the best way possible. Movie 2 Mikio would have forced Enjo into his childhood home and talked him through it. Sukaku Zanryu Mikio would have said some words and then drove to the condo immediately. 
But Mujun Razan Mikia finds that perfect mix to take on the kind of authoritative parent role people need in their lives sometimes. Mikia is a grown man now. He has matured along with the rest of the cast. He just does it so elegantly that it's something most people don't even notice. Mikia is mostly a character people bounce off of. He provides the structure people lacking in it need. I talked earlier about how Shiki and her house provided Enjo with a good environment in which he could actually start to enjoy life, and that's true. But Shiki is very laissez-faire. Which is fine, Shiki's more of a friend than anything, but what Enjo needed is a parent figure. Mikia is daddy, hence why when Mikia and Enjo meet, they work really well together. Enjo gets what he's essentially needed all along in a supportive figure who pushes him to do what he needs. The difference between Mikia and Shiki is best displayed in this. Shiki tells him, hey, you remember your home, your childhood home? Not the one you came from, but the one you grew up in. She talks to him about it. Mikia just takes him there. That is the biggest difference between the two. Shiki is cognizant of these things. Mikia does stuff about them. Which again, that's not to say either one of them is wrong in the way they go about helping Enjo, but one's definitely more effective than the other. Mikia takes Enjo to his childhood home, and he learns to be mindful of where his life is at. He goes there, walks in the living room of this decrepit place, and he just starts reminiscing. The first memory he recalls, in a callback to the earlier scene of him getting a key for Shiki, is his own father giving him the key to their home. In doing this, his father hands him both security and responsibility, teaching him that it's important to keep what you love safe. A lesson his father failed to abide by, but one Enjo will live by. This memory influences more than him just getting a key for Shiki. Enjo wants to go and save Shiki because of this moment. Of course, his brainwaves are a little mixed up and he wants to literally give his life to save Shiki, but this clearly is something foundational to him. Shiki is the only thing he loves, so he feels it's his duty to protect and save her in whatever way he can. This moment influenced the rest of his life for both the positive and the negative but mostly positive. It's one of those things that's very hard to warp, even though he still does sometimes. In this moment, it's a rare one of his family actually being happy. And again, it clearly means the world to Enjo. It's got all these bright colors. It's very wholesome and just idealish. It's beautiful to look at. It feels like the most warm shot in this entire series. The scenes get progressively dimmer and dimmer in lighting as the family falls apart. His father can't keep a job due to hitting someone while drunk at driving, and this causes their living spaces throughout the years to be vandalized. The father, by all means, did cause this downward spiral, but he keeps trying to make things right despite the circumstances. He tries to provide security. He just couldn't stay away from the bottle. Alcoholism is clearly an escape for this man, something he clings to as his insecurities eat up more and more of his life. It's a slow change, and you can see the effect his condition has on the family as they become more disheveled and the frame moves further away. If we consider Enjo as a kind of perspective, since, you know, he's not in these shots, it's showing that he's becoming distant. He doesn't want to interact with them because he's being nurtured into an environment where doing so causes harm. People will avoid pain. He will, however, provide the best he can because he still loves his family. This all naturally makes him extremely distant emotionally, which is where he's at the night he died. This family falling apart was the only ending they could have had with how they all were. The dad may be the root cause, but the mother who looks to her son to solve things for her and the son who shuts them out are also a factor. The reason Enjo blames himself is because he recognizes that. That's not to say that he blames himself for being in an abusive household. He doesn't and shouldn't. But he realizes in this moment that if he opened up a dialogue and confronted his parents or had gotten some kind of professional help, things wouldn't have ended with them all dead. Of course, it's only logical that Enjo acted the way he did in the situation he was in. Nothing could or can change the way things played out. But this scene isn't him blaming himself for not fixing things. 
This is him blaming himself for not having perspective, for not caring about or considering what someone else might think. Gains the ability to do that after this. It's important to keep what you love safe, but Enjo realizes that he wasn't doing that, because it's important to love yourself. You know, he realizes that he does love himself. He has value and improves the lives of those around him. Shiki in this movie is unlike how she's ever been seen before. When she talks with Enjo, she's moving her feet in a playful manner and talking about meaningless things. She also starts doing laundry and takes care to note who's in and out of her home. Because of him, Shiki grows to be a person who has things figured out on the inside and on the outside. He had an impact on her. When he meets Mikia, he helps him come up with a way to save Shiki. They become friends and clearly don't mind each other's company. Even in utterly meaningless seeming ways, Enjo has value. His suicidal devotion to Ryogi Shiki was only going to get him killed. It was never going to accomplish anything beyond that. In that state, he was worthless. Worthless because he didn't understand the value he had. His life was small and insignificant on a larger scale, but he gave himself meaning. That's something no one else can give you or ascribe to you or capture for you in retrospect. Got to do it yourself. It's ironic that Arya cast Enjo aside as a useless pawn. Arya wanted to keep a record of every human so that they wouldn't be forgotten in their meaningless, toiling lives, yet can't see the value people in front of them already have. A person like Enjo is the antithesis to his ideology. Be it even in a small window or for a small time, Enjo will not be forgotten by the ones who cared about him. Arya was haunted by the bloody remnants of a battle. He felt like they all died for no reason and that none of them would be remembered. He was looking at it way too broadly though. War being something that humanity really needs to get over aside, each person in that battle had value in some small way to themselves. Arya is the type of person who considers Toko corrupt for choosing to live a normal life. He could never hope to understand someone like Enjo, who was just a regular guy. Arya had no perspective. None. Only himself and a goal so masturbatory and self-righteous his high horse was made of concrete and steel. Human connections, self-worth, and appreciating the day-to-day -day while you got it. That's why Enjo is the one who defeated Arya. That's why Shiki comes to value every aspect of her life. That's why the most powerful words in this entire series are, I was here.